Hello and welcome here to the gardens at Burton Agnes Hall. Come and join me for a short walk around them. Let's take a few snapshots. There are some wonderful compositions here. Then we'll go and do some painting and we'll paint in all sorts of mediums and have great fun. Agnes Hall here in East Yorkshire. I've been given the privilege of being artist in residence at the Hall here last year and this year, 2000-2001. And that's given me the opportunity to really explore different materials and mediums and hopefully become a little better at some of them. <laughs> I want to share that with you. Uh, I'm going to show you the different ways that I've explored watercolour, coloured inks, acrylic inks, oils, pastels, drawing, mixed mediums, um, as an introductory video in the hope that uh, it will stimulate you to also try these things yourself and gain from it in your own work. I'm not going to say this is the only way to paint. I'm not going to say this is the right way to do it. I'm just going to show you ways that I have used and found so that you can explore those and enjoy them. <laughs> Fluid and just 
Just moving around here, change the position of that a bit. You see what I mean by natural now? Because what I'm going to do is build up this canvas in where the brush strokes will go with a primer and make it almost in pasta so that when I do the brush strokes they'll scumble across the surface, you see. It's fine, you're doing, you're doing very well. Not in pain yet, are you? No, you're okay, it's a bit chilly, but we'll move on to the other side. Let me give you a brief introduction to some of the materials and brushes that we're going to use in watercolour and oil painting. It only needs to be brief. I say that because some people make it far too complicated. For instance, fishermen might keep a whole box of floats that they've collected over the years, fancy gizmos and wonderful inventions. And they might have a hundred floats. Same with artists, they might have two hundred brushes. But we only actually need about five or six different types. Let me start with the watercolour brushes. Here, for instance, are two flat brushes. They're both nylons. Nearly all of my brushes are nylon these days. I find that they're quite adequate and almost as good as the sable, and far less expensive and go further. And one has different textures in them too, in this case a fairly stiff texture for working dry brush work over rough paper. So they're great for doing square edges, or larger areas of a road or path. If we want to do rounder edges, or finer points, then we need some round brushes, so I'll keep a series of rounds in but from the smallest to a medium, say up to a ten. I also keep in these wonderful little brushes in three or four different sizes called um, sword brushes or knife brushes and you'll notice that they have um, a blade shape one way and a narrow the other and they're wonderful for doing figure painting or um, the legs and arms of figures where you can twist the brush to suit the, the shape and the flow that you're doing. And I keep in a lovely oval wash brush narrow one way, wide the other, and this is great for doing large washes or fine work. In fact, I can almost do an entire painting with the one brush, a must for me. And finally, the hake brush, made out of horsehair, holds a lot of water. When semi-dry, can be used for texturing as well, for making trees and things, great for birch trees. And again, good for washes or doing large wet into wet paintings. Now really, those are the only shaped brushes that I need. I don't need to have a lot more brushes than those. I can manage with just different sizes of those brushes. The paints that I use, I'm going to show you in just a moment on screen and I'll show you a large sheet first and then the individual series of um, blocks of colour so you can see them more clearly with the names on them. All you have to do is put your video onto pause so you can copy down the, uh, the names of the colours and buy them later. I'm going to show you Winsor & Newton colours and they must be artist colours. It's important in watercolour that we only use artist quality. They're much finer, they're much more fluid, they're much more translucent and they go further. So it isn't a matter of just the cheapest. The cheapest aren't necessarily the best in the long run. Those that are tra more transparent and a brighter colour and go further are going to be better value in the long run. So artist colour, I'm going to show you the Winsor & Newton colours and the way I keep them quite simply for myself is just to put them in half palettes like this where they dry out and I can just re-soak them whenever I want or re-top them up. These are liquid paints that I put in from tubes into these palettes. Let me show you the colours now. Now oil painting, again I'm going to show you the colours in just a moment. Let me show you some of the brushes first. I do keep in a rigger brush in both oils and watercolour for very fine work occasionally. That's something I didn't show you but it is a round, very long fine brush for doing very long fine lines, quite useful. And in the oil paints, because I'm a fairly impressionist painter, I tend to stick with my flats nearly all the time. And these are nylon flats, you can see they're flat one way, square at the end and they're great for just dabbing on the paint. You can use an edge to make a rounder point or a broader stroke that way or you can just paint with a blade. And I also keep in some round brushes as well. This is a medium rigger to do my finer lines and finer work like branches and twigs or finer portrait work. And I'll keep these flats in in about five different sizes. Here's a smaller one and you can imagine with that I can paint quite fine areas. But apart from the brushes, well while I'm at it I'll mention 
it's not just nylon brushes. The nylon brushes wear longer and last longer, but you're quite adequate with the bristle brushes, the cheap hog hair brushes that you can buy in the market for two or three pounds. Great for painting with. They won't last quite as long, but they're quite adequate. We don't need really expensive fancy brushes. Now apart from brushes we can also apply oil paint with other tools. You can apply it with your fingers, you can apply it with a piece of rag, a piece of cloth, a piece of stick. But uh, brushes are the most acceptable. But the next most acceptable and most well known are the painting and palette knives, these things. Now if you look at the difference between them, especially at an edge, there is a palette knife and there is a painting knife. And you'll notice that the painting knife has an angled blade so that when you're against a canvas like that the blade touches the canvas but your fingers don't, whereas with a palette knife of course your fingers will be touching the oil paint and you get into a mess. Now you needn't really buy them both, it's probably better to have the, the painting knives for both jobs because they'll do both jobs, you can mix paint with a palette with that one, you can apply it with the, uh, with, with, with the knife as well. And different shapes of them, here's a small triangular trowel and a larger blade of painting larger areas or longer strokes edgewise on for thin lines. So those were painting and palette knives, and I would suggest you only bother buying the painting knife. The ways of applying it, um, I, my own preference is to do brushwork first with the large brushes and build up the whole canvas first in my basic tones, and then work the palette knifing over the top. It saves so much time, they look very good with the texture of the brushwork against the palette knife work, but it's your choice. As I said in the video, there are so many ways of working, so many right ways, and only a few ways that are actually wrong in the fact that they won't work. But there's no one right way of painting. These are things you must experiment and explore with and just enjoy doing and find your way. All I'm doing on this video is showing you some more new ways. extended it just goes across my knees so comfortably like that the legs extend out there and all I want to do is fit my ball up and slot it on top and it's easy and the point with it is that it's so light and easy to carry around okay oh, I'll never go with them with this limited palette so what I've got there is some yellow ochre some ultramarine blue some burnt sienna and a bit of indigo there rather than crush it this time I'm going to play with those warms and cools quite subtly here, hopefully. In fact, I'm going to add another, I've said that, I'm going to use those limited palette right throughout this painting, except here, where I want that lovely little piece of um, greenery that's in the background coming through there. Um, I'm going to put that in first of all, so that I can then use the rest of my colours straight off these, this limited palette without bothering with these uh, other colours at all. Um, and I'm going to use some areola yellow there which is, my, again, one of my favourite yellows. Get it cleaned up, I've got to reach to my palette now to get a different colour. That's, um, I've got a little bit of green with this, just to tad it down a bit. Just put, put a wash in there straight away, because I want that to dry off hard-edged when I do my painting around it. A little bit stronger with the yellow. Little flowers in the background here. 
And I've got to start looking at the cools back there as well, so I'm going to take a, a touch of cerulean, just drop some of those very light cools back into there. I'm only going to use two brushes in this job, my little round and my wash brush. Just on the edge there, it's a bit darker. I'm going to go a, a touch warmer and darker with the green into a few of these shadows here. But not too dark because I want the darkness of the stone to show against that. Just establish those colours first anyway. There we are, that'll do for that background. Get that dry off. So wet into wet there. Thin wash of oriole and yellow first. And um, then dropping in some light blues with the uh, cerulean and a little bit more of, 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 of a green coming in. In fact, I think I, I, want to, I want to push that green a little. I'm going to drop a, a little touch of sap green in there as well, just to make it a bit greener in the background. I do want it to look very different to the warms I'm going to put in on these. That's better. On these, um, it's a stonework. Right, so I can't go near that for the minute, but I can start on this lot. And I've got to look at the subtle differences between the warms and cools and lights and darks here, just using these few colours. So I'm going to go back to my big brush now, my wash brush, give it a clean. Just kind of got some water to paint with, rather than go down to the taps. I've nicked it from the goldfish pond, but it's quite adequate for what I want. So just got a bit of paper. This is not even stretched. I've just um, taped it down with some uh, masking tape as a quick study. It's very dark down here and gets lighter as it comes around this way. So what I'm going to do is put, um, I'm going to paint wet next to wet with this at first rather than wet into wet. I'm going to start with a fairly warm colour down here and cut around to cool as I come around. So I'm going to start with my yellow ochre and a little touch of burnt sienna into it. Just come straight down there. And that will come round into wherever the colour is. If I, if I do it at the same time, see you've got a hassle, that will come round into these curves here. I haven't done a very, very detailed drawing, you'll notice. Um, just enough to uh, know where my colours are going to go. I'll get it warm around there. So I'm going to drop wet next to wet and wet into wet as I go along here. And I'm going to drop some wet into wet now and just strengthen that a little bit. Going a, a little touch of the uh, to soften this edge of this.
this, this seems just a subtle change. I'm going to add a little more of the burnt sienna up here and just subtly indicate these stonework coming down there. Look, I don't want to put tons in. It's so it's so easy to start wanting to paint in every brick or every we just we just want to indicate and feel it. You want something to look cool, you put something warm next to it. You don't keep piling the cools on. Mm. And just indicate the stonework there. It's, it's so easy. Yeah. It's a lovely loose way of working, and that's what I'm trying to get you guys to do. Is so many people come to me and they want to loosen up. They've got so used to doing just traditional methods, and uh, look at that lovely rich colour we can get there. Look with a bit of um, burnt sienna and a little touch of um, ultramarine, and we'll darken into there as well. We can just indicate those bits of stone work coming down there too. Bring these colours into here a bit more. Show some of the shadow down that bit. And it's all pulling together. Um, now we'll look at the shadows in here. We'll drop a little bit of that into there. That's quite a dark edge down there. I'll we'll come back to that in a moment. I want to get this, this I'm using a bit of the white paper now as well. I want to keep a little bit of freshness going, so we won't totally take all the white away at this stage. It's much, much darker around there. And then there's a bluer tint back here. I'll come back to those pinks in a minute. You want to get going on it yourself? Well, you've seen how now, so why not? I mean, if you think you've seen enough, you just go ahead and paint. Yeah. But it is a lovely, I mean, you know, we can go out and paint bright, bright flowers and these wonderful landscapes, but yet in here there's something so subtle and nice and atmospheric. And look at these lovely colours and tones we can play in a place like this, you know. So we're playing our lights against the darks, warms against the cools. Use that red quite thinly down here. And up through here. And then we'll drop in the yellows again in a moment. I just want to pull that together a little Just a little bit of dry brushwork, even though it's a fairly smooth paper. I'm using a uh, 140 pound uh, waterfoot. Not at the moment, so there's not much texture to it. That wasn't meant to be a pond then, anyway. Yellows into here. And it's much, much darker down into here, so I'm going to have to play some really deep colours in a moment. Very loosely at first, and dropping colours in. It takes practice. That's all you can do it, but it just will take some practice. I see you don't mind that you have drips. Oh no, not at this stage. <laughs> no, I don't mind your shorts. I don't mind your shorts at all. Sorry, no. No, because no I'm going to um, tighten up into no, this. No, I think honestly though, I think we often worry. I think too much detail. Know, that if we get a drip or something, oh, right. too, too much paint. Too much detail. Then you think, oh no, it's ruined. And no, some of these sometimes say to me, oh, come and start again, because you know it's all got yeah, some. Not trying to make a photograph. I'm. See, that's where you say. So professional artists get drips as well. Mm -hmm. We play with our drips. I mean, the idea is to use what we call controlled accidents. So I'm making these accidents while controlling them as they go on. I think Cal made a mistake and then had to go over. Rather than so it starts all over again, you can work with it. Yeah, I can put pastels over the top. So I mean, if I lose one, I can bring soft pastels and work over the top. And again, if you look at the work I've got over there, you'll see that. So we'll be able to explain that to them, I expect. So I'll do it in the sky. You might do it really.
after all. You never know what you're going to do. Well, it's something I wouldn't dare attack on my own sort of thing. Drawing has to be that's a fairly strong to start with, otherwise we can get into a slight mess with a square painting. <laughs> Come look at it then, or what? We were finished here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there we go. Just the two brushes. I hardly needed to use the fine one because I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it. And we finish up with. Well, you've seen my demonstration, and now you've just seen the two works of the students that watched me do that and have now taken that and used it in their own way. And you notice that both of the paintings are quite different, and both have got different experiences from doing them. What do you think you've learned from this particular session? I think I've learned an awful lot more about colour, because really when you walk in here, you just think of very pale colours. But when you look more closely, and with your explanation, one can see there's a lot more depth of colour and variation. It's been really great, really enjoyed it because the weather was a bit daunting with rain out there but coming inside here just looking at the light and the colours and the turns, it's been really enjoyable.
when I put the wet into wet background on. This gives me a nice blurred out of focus background and sharp edges here for the butterfly. Let me show you how that's done and then two more examples. Yeah. Here you can see the butterflies are drawn out and the masking fluid has been put on and allowed to dry. So I'll paint my wet and wet effects in, then the butterfly, then rub off the masking fluid and paint in the details and delicate colours of the flowers. In this case a small tortoise shell on Budlia and in this case a painted lady on the same. You can see the soft wet into wet background and then I can pick out over the white paper that the masking fluid has been taken off. I can pick out the lighter colours and put in the darker ones in between. It's quite effective, isn't it? Good morning. A nice, bright, early morning here at Burton Agnes. And I'm going to do a rather more delicate watercolour this morning. A rather more detailed one. I've shown you these lovely gutsy ways of using pastel and coloured inks and oils um, but now perhaps you'd like to see something a little more delicate. So I'm going to paint the little statue over there which shortly will have the fountain running from it and it's an ideal opportunity to show you um, a way of painting using light against darks, using counter change where we've got light dark, light dark and also edges where we've got wet into wet and soft edges and where we've got wet on dry where you get a hard edge. So we can leave a hard light edge against a, da a dark edge with a sharper edge or we can gently blend things in the distance. Remember that when you've got a load of greens around you like this that the greens can at first tend to look the same in the distance as they are in the front. But you know in your painting you have to make things regress. You have to have the warmer colours in the foreground and the cooler in the background. You have to have the texture in the foreground and the detail and less detail in the background. So we go warm, cooler, cooler, cooler. We'll go sharp and in focus and then we'll go gradually out of focus. We'll have the light against the darks. I've already put some masking fluid onto this for the little highlights of pinks and bright colours but I'd have a job painting around on such a small painting and in the time I've got available. So I'll carry on now. I've painted some delicate uh, background colours here with a little bit of um, aerolian yellow and some uh, cobalt blue and I shall delicately now drop into these colours um, to give my background soft effects and then start to put in my light areas that I'm going to paint dark edges around so I get the sunlit um, light coming through between these layers of plants. You might notice also that I've decided to paint within an oval shape this time um, because I find that shape is rather attractive with this composition I've got. A square would be a bit harsh against it. So don't just choose to paint on a square paper. You can buy mounts uh, ready made as ovals, you can have them made up. You choose. Don't be bound by just tradition. Or These can be a warm green or a cool green. This is a fairly warm green at the moment. And the different shapes of the leaves as well. You leave these light leaves showing here, look and put the darks against them coming out. So we've got this counter change of light and then dark. 
And again back here we'll be doing the same. We'll leave some light leaves showing. And we'll put the dark in between. Blend these colours back one into another. This is just the ultramarine and a little touch of burnt sienna. Give me a nice grey that I can control to warm or to cool. Gradually build these terms up. Give a little bit more violet to the shadow here. One of the tricks is not to get one part too far ahead of another part. What I'm doing here is just gradually building this up. It won't be long before I say that's enough. At the same level as the rest of it will stop. to do a lot more to this painting otherwise it starts turning and turning into an illustration we don't want an illustration but I will just pick out a few more of these darks here against the lights so we've got the light against the dark dark against the light, the light against the dark, and here again the dark against the light. So we're looking through into layers, one layer, two layers, three layers. And gradually building this texture up fairly loosely so that I can stop whenever I want, which is one of the things in my painting that I keep repeating. I want to be in control. I need to stop whenever I need to stop, not when the painting says, when it feels right. I must keep leading you on. It's quite hard in watercolour sometimes to know when to stop fiddling and just leave it alone. I'm almost at that stage now with this one. I'm going to bring a few of these warm greens out here in the foreground. Just give a bit more power. Sunlight's suddenly come out again now and all of my colours are getting stronger and changing. here so that the eyes leg through, the softer colours behind.
And I'll just put a few of these little warm stalks in here, again to leave the eye forward, so it make the things in the background a little bit softer. you how to do a really loose and free watercolour. So we're going to rush into it, we're going to be playing with light and luminosity and fluidity, no drawing at all, just going to enlarge some of these beautiful fuchsias and just enjoy letting one colour flood into another. And I've got to think on and say what the hell am I going to paint here? <laughs> right. Um, hmm. I don't think this colour's going, but I haven't been used to it every day. Really enjoyable working lovely and loose like this. They don't always work out. You might only get one in five that really works out nicely. But it's so enjoyable to do them and when they do work, they're so special and so free and so loose, which is what we're after. Nice cadmium orange now, splash in there. Get out fly. Some of my colours on my paintings have been so bright recently that I've had bees and um, sawflies actually coming in and landing and trying to get pollen off them, which is, I suppose, uh, quite an honour to be that my colours are considered the, the right sort of colours. Cadmium red now. It's a nice deep red, cadmium red. Really splash it on and enjoy it. Seems nutty at first, but it does pull together as you go on. As they dry and as they tighten, we can gradually sharpen the edges. I say it takes a bit of guts because <laughs> it seems so messy at first, you don't believe it can come together at all, but it will. working out where I am. Lovely loose brush strokes. Just feel your way around the nice petals. Clean lemon forms. yellow coming in here for the sunlight on the leaves in between. I'll try and catch it while it's still wet. It's not drying off very fast with the sunlight directly on here. A bit of viridian into it. 
get some nice greens going now in the background. Fresh and loose. Just a few more of these stems in, the cooler ones. You don't need much more. You can experiment to say some will work, some won't, some are looser, some are better. The more you do, the more you loosen up, the better they'll get. When we get back a bit from this painting and it'll, like an impressionist painting, it'll make sense more when you're a bit further away from it. But it's a beautiful thing, watercolour, and this way of working is so lovely and loose that it really explores the potential of watercolour rather than being too tight with it. Just take one or two stronger greens now. start drawing a flower like this, don't just start with a petal and try and work your way around. What I've done is gone around the basic shape here with the shape of the whole flower first, worked out where things are going to be approximately and then when I know that shape I can start to draw the petals in within that shape so I know it's going to fit. Hi, before we start doing watercolours out of doors, let's do a few of the techniques we might want to use on close-ups of flowers. For this flower, I'm just going to lay on a wash of um, cobalt violet, which will give me this lovely pink to purple undercoat. And just bring in these little petals Because there's so many of them that I want this lovely furry, slightly rough effect. Just drag them out into the paper like that. And I'm going to then do a, a little bit of wet into wet to give me some tones, just gently to change the tones around. Leave it to dry and then I shall paint wet over dry to have sharper edges. So now I'm going to go a fraction cooler and go down to some mauve just to give the undercoat some depth. Keep it very light and airy. You can see already we're starting to get some form to it. These edges are a bit darker around here. And it just gently blends in. And the rest I shall do in more detail when it's dry. 
There's a slight red tint to those edges. So I'm going to use a little bit of rose. Beautiful carbon rose. And just go around the tips of these and let it blend in. So I don't want hard, sharp edges yet. And there's also a little bit stronger than rose coming in there. A little bit of, I suspect, a little bit of alizarin crimson around here. There we are, isn't that pretty? Now, while I've still got the alizarin crimson nice and wet, a little bit stronger still, there we go. See how that spreads out delicately there? I'm going to just take a touch of aerolean yellow, which is a slightly darker yellow. There we go. Not too thick, that's a little bit too heavy, so wash my brush out and thin it down a bit. There we go, look. Bring that round and let it touch this wet paint at the edges. And see how it just flows in softly? There. Now I'll let that dry and I can work into those a bit later. There's a very slight green tint in here. I'm just going to drop a little bit of green into there, which will play against the mauve. There we are, that'll do for the moment, we'll let that dry. Oh, we've got a lighter coloured flower here, so we could really do with a darker background around this flower to show it out. In this case, I'm going to start um, with the lighter tints of the petals, this one here, um, and drop in uh, some colours wet into wet, and as it dries, gradually get a little harder and stronger with the colours. And then as I finish off, I'll just put in an outline colour of um, a deep blue with a slight tint of green to show the flower out. All right, what colours do we have here first? Well, we always start with our lighter colours. We've got a cream here, a very, very light pink and, and some, some cool blues going down into there. So I'm going to start with very delicate washes. I'm going to start with a little lemon yellow to establish these creams here. And it is so pale and so fragile, that's why we're going to need to um, have a darker background around it. Very, very pale. But of course, you know that watercolour is going to dry a little bit lighter anyway. So we can go a fraction stronger than you might suspect. And what I am going to do actually, having just looked at this statement here, I'm going to go back to the masking fluid and just put a couple of little bits of uh, lines of masking in here and around some of these little highlights just to catch the light. Something I've noticed myself now, so at any stage you can stop your painting and make these changes, providing you're not going to get a hard edge somewhere. So if I don't want a hard edge on these, what I'm going to do now is, very quickly, so I can stop, take some clean water and blend those edges into the paper so they almost vanish. And that means that in my future coats I can come up to those without any nasty hard edge showing through the transparent paint. So there's one little trick for you from the very beginning. So I'm going to stop there and just come back and get the masking fluid. Right, we're going to come back to this little purple flower. And I'm going to work on the inside here. Um, what you can do is, to get wet into wet still, you can come back with some clean water over an area you've done, but do make sure that area is dry. That's clean water right around here now. So when I come back into that with my paint, where it's wet it will spread slightly and where it's dry it'll be sharper. Now here you see it's spreading out a little, just enough to give me that texture that I want. And as I come into the picture those marks become sharper. In the same way as when I come outside the wet area, we have sharper marks again. So you can get this lovely delicate variety there. Now let's look at the petals. And a slightly warm mode for that, not too strong. 
That's quite adequate, I would think. Let's have a look. Let's pick these petals out now. Just come round the edges of them. We can pick out each one. Showing the tips. And the tips become darker as they come out against the light here. You can always go darker in a minute and bring them out even further. The ones that are coming towards us are foreshortened, so we can go in these little areas of drawing as they come out more sideways, they get longer. fill in little areas between them so that the tips show light. Of course you could do these with a far more impressionist technique. I'm drawing fairly carefully at the moment but um, you could be much looser with your work and just have an effect of light. Which in fact you will see in some of the oil paintings I've done later where I've just done almost blobs of colour onto another because the light levels of an evening or morning are so low that you don't see all of this detail. Notice that I'm just changing the tints occasionally from a warm to slightly cooler because that tends to do that on the flower. Do really observe. It's no good just slapping anything on everywhere. You've got to look at the flower. You've got to look at the objects, whatever you're drawing, whether it's portrait or landscape. You need to look at them carefully. You don't have to represent every single one exactly, but do observe and understand the tones and the changes of colour. There we are, we're almost there, a nice delicate little piece, and I'm just going to go in a bit stronger yet. Some of these areas here need to be a little bit darker. Now that's dried off, look, I can go in and it's still a little bit damp, just damp enough, just darken it up to bring some of these highlights out a bit further. And again, I can go into some of the slightly darker areas of the petals in here. You can see how you can build up by putting one coat over another. With watercolour, remember, if you take a layer of paint, let it dry and put on exactly the same thickness of paint over that layer afterwards, it will obviously go two tones darker. But what I'll do is, just to explain that a little more clearly, let me just do that up here and let it dry and then later on we'll um, put another coat over it. I'll keep the coat spare so that we, can, we know it's the same one. There we are. That just shows that little flower there quite nicely I think. Now let's just have a go at this business of a, of, of a wash. I'm going to take in fact that very colour we've just been using, the mauve, and use it thinly. There we go. I'll just put a coat on there. And I'll blend it out slightly. This is how you can bring watercolour out to thinner to thinner look. There we go. And you can blend it right out to a clean coat. If you want to drop something into that, wet into wet, and do a little bit of paint, look at the lovely effects you can get by doing that look. How that spreads out. It's a little bit of warm into there for fun. And look at these wonderful effects you can get. You can do that for cloud effects or flowers or blending leaves into leaves. Great fun. There's a bit of green to that. 
Let's have a bit of, a bit of experimenting all around it. Let's drop a little bit of green into there. So you can imagine the sort of effects you can get for your leaves and plants. And we'll let that dry and I'm going to put this same thickness of coat over in a minute. And you'll see it going from the same transparency here and as it goes over it will go a tone darker. But we've got to let that dry to do that. Let's move back to one of our flowers now. And what I'm going to do here is a little bit of wet into wet and I'm going to show you how we can do blending. So I'm going to coat the entire rose in this little pink flower in rows. Not only blending but also wet over dry and then blend and working out. Now I'm going to let that one dry for the moment. I just hit a little bit more rose. There is an effect, a lovely effect here that we can just get a little bit of wet into wet with. And look at this gorgeous. Do you see? I don't know how close the camera can go in on that but I want it right in on the brush here. Look at this gorgeous way we can let these bits of rose leach out and spread out. I'm going to put quite strong paint on here and it'll all spread out beautifully. I can just tickle it. Don't go swamping it. Just tickle in with the tip of your brush. And look at these lovely effects you can get of the wet into wet. Let's just tickle around the edges of these petals here. As it spreads out, it's getting a little bit drier now, that's fine. And I'm going to go even stronger into here, because I still want my wet into wet effects here. Isn't that so lovely? And it's just what we call controlled accident. Let any fine detail I can bring in, in a minute. In fact, I don't need to do much more on this flower, it's, it's working out so nicely. I can just let that dry off and just tickle in some details later. I'm going to put a little bit of yellow in the middle. In fact, it's a very low level of yellow again, so I'm going to use a little bit of the aerolian yellow again. And there we are, just let that spread delicately and now let that dry. And that'll be fine. We can work on that in a moment. Right, now we're going to have a go at our big star here. Um, it's a little more mauve than the pink was. And I'm going to do a very similar effects of dropping wet into wet. Here I'm going to go in with the brush around this and do a little bit of uh, wet onto dry later. I'm going to start with my cobalt violet again. And a little touch this time of cerulean blue. I'm going to start with the blue because there's quite a bit of cool happening into here. Now I've got to do this fairly quickly because I'm painting wet onto a wet edge, not straight into it. In this case I painted wet into the wet, in this case I'm painting wet up next to the wet. Right, now onto my cobalt violet and I just touch the edges of the cobalt violet and look how that blends in. So we've had wet into wet, now we're wet next to the wet as it nicely blends in. And then I can do the same in the centre, bring in my rose. The wet next to the wet and it spreads out beautifully. We can combine techniques with this, you see. If I must start to put my little furry effects here in the middle. And we've done wet next to wet, and now I'm going to do wet directly into it. I'm just going to drag these colours out there first. Just subtly drag them out, these little furry bits. A little bit stronger, a bit of lisbon and a little bit of mauve. Wet into wet. So 
And there's a combination of ways of using the watercolour, wet next to it and wet into it. And when I put some darks behind this towards the end, the fly will show up. Got a little bit of masking way. fluid on. We've got our, our creams in here. Um, now I'm going to just tint up with my light pinks and blues. Because the tinting is so very, very light. Most of the work on this flower is going to be done by showing the light against the dark later. So, very subtle, light tints of warms and cools. You see I'm using some cerulean and a little bit of violet to come into here. Now, we were talking about wet into wet and blending as well. So, I'm just going to let those tints dry off. Then I'm going to put these bits of red in and soften the edges so that they blend into the lily. Go a little bit darker into the centre of that lay as well. You can see the masking fluid here just starting to show a little now. There we go, we'll let that dry off now. We've got the feeling of form here and that nice lightness about it. Before we go on with the flower, let's put a little bit of darkness around it. Let's deliberately now hit some slightly darker colours so you can see how this will stand out. Nice dark around that. Sharp edge of the lily. Let's just work up to this daisy a moment, shall we do? Cut some around anymore. Right, I've just put a little bit of darker tone behind the white lily, and you can see how it makes it stand out. And how even using some of the more opposites in the colour circle here. The yellows, purples, greens, purples help to make that stand out as well. Just to show you what will happen in the actual garden if you were close up. Now let's have a look at this business of putting um, these reds in and blending them out as carefully as we can. So again, back to my rose. The lovely girl rose. Here we go. Don't be too strong. Just getting the right amount of colour on my brush. I'm going to stay towards the centre of the pattern at first. Oops, that was a bit wet there. And just drop in, wet into wet, where I need it, a little stronger colour. Come right back into the petals here, and here, this lovely diamond shape. Now that's a bit better, we've got a nice hard edge there. I'm having to work fairly quickly to demonstrate for you. And again, a little harder into there at the end, wet into wet, wet into wet here again, here again. Some reds down at the bottom, a little bit coming out there, and there. Even a little tint of it coming into the lily here, around these petal edges. Go down a little bit stronger now to some alizarin. Now then, we want to soften, clean brush and clean water and in you come. You see how that softens it out? Just let the edge of the paint spread into there. Same here, 
a little bit sharper edge there. Now I'm going to let that dry off and then when it's dry work a little bit more um, red over that to, to pull it out more. Now this area here where we lost it a fraction just now you can still lift out a small accident like that. So I'm going to clean my brush, dry it out and see if I can, you see how I'm lifting that out? Now clean brush, wet brush and just lift out the light where you need to. Soak it out again. You can do this with tissue as well if you want to, but a dry brush will usually just lift it out enough. I will pick up on that again in a moment. Right, earlier on we did a little bit of glazing here and I showed you how to blend out. Now here's the colour that we used, which is the same as that one. If I bring that colour across here, and you can see how it comes from the same as here to going a tone darker. And when that dries, if I had to do it again that way, it would go a tone darker again. You can see there's the same colour here as we have here and here, but where it goes over the coat underneath, it's a tone darker, which is something you can do with your flowers all the same, same as here. I'm going to put a little bit of wax, no colour at all, straight on the end of these, just as an experiment, and we'll see if that does manage to resist enough. If not, then something I could do, if I didn't resist here, and I didn't leave them behind, I could make a little bit of white gouache up and tint the white gouache in at the very end of the painting. I personally prefer to try and keep to pure luminous watercolour the whole time. But you can use a little bit of gouache for highlights, sparkling on water, splattering snow scenes. You know, it can be very useful at times. Right, we've done that. Now I'm going to drop in one colour over another again and then let it dry and pick up the uh, dark areas afterwards. Let's start with these gorgeous blues. Now there's probably two or three different blues going on here. So I'm going to start by giving the whole thing a coat of cerulean. And quite strong cerulean this time. There's my wax look, resisting there. And here. Here we go. Let's enjoy this. Now it's simply a matter of timing and control. The more the paint dries, the harder edges you're going to get. Quite different effects to all of the other ones. Each flower has very similar qualities that we can use, but we're just diversifying, changing the technique slightly, and linking some of those techniques together as well. The light stamens have remained behind, just as I hope they would, with the wax resisting look. We can get this gorgeous glow, you see, with one colour over another. Shout. I want to pick out a little more detail with the rose. Now I was saying here we put one colour over another to make it a tad darker, a tad a little bit richer. I'm going to do exactly the same thing now actually on the flower. So the same rose that we used earlier, there's the colour, and I'm going to bring that rose in more detail out in these little petal shapes. And now we're getting the hard edges, the sharp edges. You can see the detail and the difference between the wet into wet. I'm going to go a little redder and come down to some cadmium red now. which should, if I use it on here, make the other reds a little cooler against it. Look at that. 
Now you see, the pinks that we've done earlier seem quite warm to you, didn't they? But now we're putting that cadmium red in, they suddenly start to go cooler. And it's important in painting to keep your play of light and colour warm next to cool, rough next to smooth, light next to little sharp edges and details around the edges of the petals. And look how that mass stands out so beautifully. So delicately. Isn't that pretty? And again it needs a dark colour around it really to make it show out. So when I've virtually finished all of these pieces of work, I'll go back and do that. And you can see how their beauty will hopefully show to you a little more clearly there. So I mean, if you were working out of doors, you see, you'd be able to put your leaves behind and bring these out in the same way. These sharper, harder edges of these lovely petals. I will just finally work into this lily with wet onto dry, a little bit of alizarin, and look how that pulls that out. Now, as soon as this is dry I'm going to be able to take away these bits of masking fluid here that I had earlier. And you'll be able to see the whole thing much more clearly in the way it should work. These little bits, and I can pick these little bits out then with the brush and give my final details on the lily. That's lovely isn't it? I'm quite pleased with that. We'll rub those out when that's dry. You can just delicately edge those in down into there. Come around these petals a little more now. As they curl over at the edges where I did the highlighting. There we are, just tidy up this daisy. Now it's, it's still a little bit damp, but we can go back in and just sharpen up one or two of these edges and pull out the petals a little. A little more, doesn't need much. There we go, he'll do. Acrylics. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on acrylics because, in some ways, they're very similar to the oils, I sort of like using oils and watercolour. They're very versatile. They can be used with a painting knife or a brush. They can be painted thinly like watercolour or they can be painted thickly like oil paint. But what I'm going to do is give you a few tips. Um, when you have a palette for acrylics, of course, acrylics dry very quickly. Uh, you have what's called a stay wet palette. This is a commercial one, it's a De La Rowney one. And if we lift the lid off, there are two compartments. In these compartments, we would have two sheets of paper. One would be like a sheet of blotting paper on the bottom, and the other would be like a kitchen paper or tracing paper on the top. And the idea is that you pour some water in, and the blotting paper absorbs the water as a reservoir, and the surface paper uh, stops the paint from going completely blobby and wet and, and soaking into it all. Now, these are quite expensive, and so is the special papers that they send. So what I'm suggesting is, and I don't want to fall out with the people that make these, although they are very efficient and I'm enjoying using them, but if you're travelling, these are a bit big and a bit cumbersome, and the papers are expensive. I'm going to give you a little tip here, and bring up from below a little box from a local hardware store, 
and many of these hardware stores have some wonderful boxes for, with compartments in for storing pastels or paints or anything. Now this one you'll notice is very shallow and it would do the same purpose as this. And what I'm suggesting is that you might have two of these and use ordinary um, blotting paper in the bottom or even kitchen paper towel because that's absorbent as well. So a sheet of kitchen paper towel in the bottom, a sheet of tracing paper on the top and you have an instant reservoir for your stay wet palette. And then I would have another palette which I would mix in. So this one would have the two sheets of paper and the paints laid on top and some dampen to keep it uh, wet because when the lid's shut you'll find that those paints will not dry out. The damp atmosphere from the paper will keep the acrylics from drying out so they'll last for ages. And in the other one I'll have the sheet of paper where I'd actually mix my colours rather than getting all the muck from mixing colours into my actual palette of colours. Just a tip, just a thought. We've already shown you about the stay wet palette with acrylics and how you can make your own stay wet palette to keep the paints from drying too quickly. What I'm going to show you now is a small part of this painting in progress. This part with the goldfish for instance and a couple of ways of using acrylic paint. I've discussed the fact that it'll dry very quickly which means we can put glazes on. In this case I've got a dark brown which will allow me to put lighter colours over the top leaving that dark brown showing through by glazing a bit like watercolour. But as it's an opaque paint, we can paint light paint over dark, which you can't with most watercolours. Now, because I can work both opaquely and transparently, I can afford to make mistakes if I need to. So I can put colours on fairly strongly. This goldfish is an interesting mixture of um, cool reds and warm reds. So you see I'm painting the paint quite thinly at the moment. And just letting that, just glazing over this dark colour. Adding some body colour, which is white. And we can blend while it's still wet, just like watercolour. And it won't be very long before that dries now and I can work over the top if I want to. I can move the colours around while they're still wet. Okay, let's paint something a little bit more thickly to give you an idea of that. So I'm going to use a little more opaque paint now, in other words a heavier paint like oil paint. You see you can put on quite strong colours, just turn that down a bit. That's better. It's still a little bit translucent but the more I put on the more it will build up a bit like watercolour. If I want to, I can thin it right down. Let's go down to a very thin glaze now to get this effect of water. I can build glazes up and up and up like this. putting light over dark. But if I want to dark back again, I can put it on whenever I want. So it's very versatile, you can work any directions you like.
Let's just say I want a dark there, rather than using the one I've got. And I can do that. And it will really glow with this other dark underneath it. Make it a little bit lighter. So you see, the acrylics can be very, very versatile. You can work any direction you want. still see these lines underneath so you can see how transparently I'm using it but I can use it thickly whenever I choose there so a nice thick opaque heavier paint and I really want to push the colours Great fun. It's very, very versatile. We'll mix a little bit more opaque paint then. In my first tray we have some pastel pencils. Now these will be used in conjunction with my larger soft pastels. Pastel pencils are usually a little harder than the soft pastels but for doing very fine details which you can't get into with the large pastels they're going to be a necessity. Some shops will sell them individually not a whole set like this. So if you wish to just buy a few lights and a few darks because you'll only need certain colours for doing the fine details normally that might be your best way around it. In my next box are watercolour pencils and they would link with my first talk on watercolours. These watercolour pencils will blend with water so you can draw them on as an ordinary coloured pencil, use a wet brush and blend them out into watercolour and you can paint the details or draw the details on with them directly onto watercolour already to get finer sharper marks if you wish. They're very useful for somebody who wants to do very fine illustrative work on flowers because you've got a full range. There are many, many, many colours that come in these already made for you. And if you can't quite mix up or get the colour you want for a fine petal, then maybe that might be an answer for you. For most of us, though, we can use just a brush and these aren't used very much, but they do have their purpose. Finally, just ordinary coloured pencils and the various grades of drawing pencils. Unfortunately they've trimmed back these yew trees since I did these paintings and uh, I've decimated it but it'll take for another hundred years before they grow back again to what they were. I decided it would be nice to do an experiment with a series of different shapes and mixed medium on surfaces. In this case, um, it follows on from doing some gold leaf work with the medieval castle some years ago where I did a three-piece triptych. Um, I liked working over the gold leafing with oil paint and working around it. So it's rather nice to build your frame first and then paint within it, rather than do a painting and then frame it afterwards. Here, I've made up some interesting shapes uh, in this case a diamond rather than just a square to paint on and I'll show you some other examples of even more interesting shapes in a moment. The outer frame has been covered with metallic foiling and the inner with gold leafing. Uh, the inner, the, the centre part of the whole panel uh, is raised 
and then painted with oil paints afterwards. And of course you can adjust your colours then to suit the framing as well. Continuing with this mixed media work, one of my pots here where I've melted glass into the bottom of it in the kiln. And I love this idea of one material and texture against another. So I've taken this onto this next panel over here and into the bottom corners um, by melting glass into small ceramic trays that I've made to go against the colours of the oil painting itself. And again on this painting we've got the gold leafing in the background and then the metallic foils, um, raised shapes again and sunk panels but the actual panel here is in four quarters almost coming up like a pyramid and then linking the flowers through and coming off onto the gold leaf panels so we've got the oils directly over and against the gold leafing as well. The oil painting and the four panels we're going to do and what sort of surfaces we can paint on. It must be a surface that the oil paint can adhere to. So we could prime with a matte emulsion. In this case, I brought some pre-primed Winter & Newton canvases in a roll and stretched them myself over three by three um, stretches. Uh, the canvas comes as white with no texture at all bar the very slight finish of the canvas itself. I'm going to use one canvas <coughs> naturally, as you see it here, white, but all of the rest I'm going to experiment with in texture. In this case, I've already textured this canvas with a mixture of ordinary interior filler and PVA glue, which gives me a, a, a good adhesion um, and will not crack and will hold the paint. But I've given a second coat over that of primer, of acrylic primer with some yellow ochre acrylic paint. That's going to be my evening scene. My morning scene, I'm going to do the similar one with, um, but I'm going to prime it with um, an eggshell green to grey for the early morning it's back, which is going to be the early morning one. Instead of just putting the texturing on anywhere, I'm going to make the texturing directional with the brush strokes and the drawing I've already roughly done. This sort of drawing is all I need to work from when I've got studies and drawings and photographs. So I'm going to, in a moment, show you how I build up this texturing with this mixture of filler and PVA mm -hmm. using hardboard. Always use the smooth side. Do not be tempted, as many amateurs are, to use a rough side of hardboard. They think it looks like canvas. It's not. When it's primed, it's a reverse of canvas and it just looks yucky. So if you're going to use hardboard, use a smooth side and prime it twice. One way once, let it dry, and then the other way the next time will give you a lovely surface. Otherwise, canvas is to make that uh, mixture to build up the texturing of the canvas. Some ordinary cheap filler, but it's interior filler, so it's nice and fine. We don't want the exterior sort, um, which is very gravelly. We could use that, but it would wear the brushes down very quickly. And I'm going to mix that up first with some water and then add my PVA glue afterwards. I don't want it too thick, otherwise I shan't be able to get it on there at all. And too thin, it will just splurge everywhere. So carefully, just enough. To make a nice heavy cream. I can always add a bit more filler if I need to. Right, now a bit of PVA glue polyvinyl acetate, basically a liquid plastic, very useful stuff. Um, it dries transparent and if you use it over tissue paper or with tissue paper you can get some wonderful effects because the tissue becomes transparent and you can put layers and layers over one another using this white glue. Same stuff that you use for woodworking, the white PVA glue. Okay, I don't want too heavy a texture on this one, so I've got just a nice creamy mixture there. I have the photograph of the um, basic composition above me. I'm not keeping the photograph of the figure out because all I want to do is gain basic direction and texture. The pathway is going to be coming out 
probably mainly in brush strokes in this sort of direction, but I sort of have some coming across. Just going to build up nice and loosely. And I've got these nice big bits of grass here and uh, iris leaves coming up. So I'm going to pile the stuff on those there. So my next stage then is to let this dry and then to make that grey-green primer for my morning light glowing through, I hope. This is the canvas for the midnight scene. You can see I've been even more heavy with the impasto of the uh, ground. Um, here we can see these large uh, trees coming in, leading into the picture, and some of the texturing of the background trees and the building here, the statue which is going to be uh, into the picture, and the figure coming into the foreground, and layering the way that the brush strokes will go into the foreground on the gravel here. Um, for this particular panel, I've also done some scenes on site, not just the photographs. I do have some photographs that I've taken, but I did a preliminary study actually at half past eleven at night. I'll show you that now. It's amazing what you can gather from just small bits of information. Um, my scribble and scrawl here were notes, colour notes, uh, as it was raining just after half past eleven. What I had done was done a quick charcoal and white chalk study of the basic tones and the lighting effects at night on the building and then written in my colour notes and the sorts of colours that I would use to mix in almost total darkness, hence the scroll. But there was enough there for me then the next morning here to use some pastels over black paper and pull out the effects of the light that I'd been seeing that night. And from that and the photographs and other working studies I've got, I should be able to put together the final painting onto the textured panel you've just seen. Here you can see how I built up the panels with 2 by one timbers and then gradually added across them panels of uh, ordinary hardboard. The hardboard was painted with blackboard paint and then with ordinary car body red oxide primer which is great for underneath the gold leafing. Working with a black background for an oil painting or a dark background is quite nice, as it is working with any coloured background to work across. It means I can work up and establish my mediums and lights fairly quickly. And here we are just sort of getting the, the portrait virtually um, built and then working loosely around it with this oil painting. Now with this technique I'm working fat over lean, so in other words I've put lean uh, thinner paint underneath and I'm now working up the uh, colours on top, using slightly thicker, more opaque, heavier paint, just in short strokes, keeping it nice and clean and pure. If I want, I can blend them in a bit. board is quite nice because like most hardboards, if they're primed with an acrylic primer or with uh, an emulsion, they're still slightly absorbent which means that you can uh, put the paint on and it's soaking some of the oil in and drying it out a little bit more quickly than it would on a smoother canvas which enables you to put cleaner colour over the top more easily.
here into the hat as well. You can use the edge of these flat brushes to drop in colours too. We don't have to use a very fine brush all the time. A bit more of a splash. Paint would be nice. I'm going to add a little bit of yellow into that in a minute to make it a bit warmer still. some cadmium orange and chrome yellow now. That's definitely going to be warm, isn't it? And let's see what we can do with that around this front edge here. That's big chunks of paint. I mean, oil paint's such a gorgeous medium. We don't want to lose that creaminess of it. Many more blues in greens than people realise. I mean, the blues become the greens. I mean, this is a very turquoisey blue, so it's more towards the green being more yellowy green than, say, the um, ultramarine, which is a warmer blue. So you see we've built up a lot of the duller colours working through to these nice bright chromes now to pick out the cooler greens. And how the sunlight starts to catch on these stems. And it wasn't that hard to do, it's just a whole series of little lines one across another. Let's put some of that brighter yellow there to push that softer yellow back in the background. So one colour against another changes the other one. I mustn't forget that, that quite often you're trying to adjust something in a painting because it seems wrong. And it won't be the thing that you think is wrong at all, it'll be something next to it. So if I put these chrome yellows in here, they'll start to push back that yellow, that yellow ochre in the background. And the girl's face will also appear to be a lot softer as well because I've used yellow ochre there and the chrome yellow will make that now seem a much softer colour. Just one or two of these dark areas down here amongst it. You see how that dark really pulls out some of these little areas under her, around her neck. Just gives a bit more depth to it. And makes those lighter colours sing. So I'm going to put these little bits of dark flecks all over. So it's like negative shapes in a way. And again, because this colour is so much stronger than the rest around it, it um, makes the other colours look softer when they were quite strong just now. So it's all comparisons, isn't it? It's all playing one thing against another. Look at that dark, really makes the start to vibrate a bit more now. Put a little bit up here as well. Just to give a bit more depth amongst these grasses. So we've got more of a three-dimensional effect. And across here too. That's just behind her arm a little bit there. Looks these flowers down here. Right up into there, just to get a bit more depth. I want to get the feeling that she is 
in amongst these plants here. It's getting a bit darker down there. And we'll just check a little bit of this dark amongst her too, just to bring out some of the forms a little more. Where her hands are there, for instance. And here. Here we have an example of my experimenting with mixed medium this year, in this case gold leaf, watercolour and pastel. And what I've done is, first of all I've started off with a China Graph pencil, which is waterproof, and done all my dark colours in, my basic drawing and shading. Then I put gold leafing in some certain areas where it would uh, be most attractive on the edges of the, of the leaves and the petals of the flowers. Uh, not too much to make it a bit trite, but just enough to make it gleam and glitter as you come past. And that gold leafing would resist the watercolour. So then I put watercolour on, and then finally I've gone over with the pastel, the opaque pastels on the top, to highlight and bring out the uh, delicacy of the watercolour underneath. Here are a series of works I've been doing this year with um, acrylic inks and pastel over the top. Watercolour and pastel is beautiful, we've seen that, but this year I've been playing with the acrylic inks which are even stronger and brighter. So we'll show you a few examples of that here and you can see the strength of colour feel that you can get with these inks and the pastels over the top. Now into soft pastels. These are not oil pastels, these are soft pastels and they are made basically with a small amount of gum, pure pigment, ground down to a quite a fine pigment, not as fine as watercolour, but like watercolour they are pure and they shouldn't change in direct sunlight much uh, and they're going to be as clean as you're going to get a colour. Now I love the unisons. There are many different types of pastel and there are uh, different makes giving different hardnesses. For instance, the unison are very soft um, and inscribe are quite hard pastels. Now that matters in the way you lay pastels onto your paper because if you put a soft pastel on first and try and put a hard pastel at the end, it won't go on, it'll try and cut into the paper and so on. So these are things to be considered and I'll mention a bit more about that when I'm actually demonstrating pastels shortly. I would recommend these unisons though because they have such a wonderful colour range. And if we look at their colour sheet, just look at the variety of beautiful cools and warms we have there and the variations of each different colour, blues, greens, reds, purples, violets and also the wonderful variety of darks and lights which I haven't seen so many pastels have. And they've got some specialist ranges as well. Not only do they have certain artists recommending certain series, but they're bringing out little packs of special colours such as these. And also these beautiful turquoises. Now I have my own range and we'll show those on screen as we have the watercolours and the oils shortly. But this is the basic range that I've got here in these boxes that I'll show you. Not only are using Unison's wonderful colours, they, they also are good value for money because they're nice big chunky pastels. I always advise that students remove the paper from their pastels. That's why I do a sheet as the one I've just shown you. Because once you've taken the papers off, you forget which pastel was which and which colour was which if you want to buy a new one. 
So you'll notice in this full box I've been using a while but I've already taken the papers off. And the reason for doing this is that I can use a pastel sideways on and not inhibited. I can use the tip or the side straight off as you'll see me doing later. You're always inhibited if the paper's still on. And another beauty of unisons is they don't fall apart. I mean, obviously, if you keep pushing them and using them a lot, they will start to crumble or become smaller. But I found with many soft pastels, as soon as you remove the paper, they just disintegrate into little tiny pieces. And that's fine if you're doing very, very delicate work or very illustrative work. But if, like me, you're more of an impressionist and a bit more gutsy and want to get out there and really enjoy using these colours, then these are ideal for you. And they'll supply these boxes if you order them um, with the pastels as well, which is nice to carry. I have proper pastel boxes and cases, but quite honestly, I find that carrying the pastels like this is just as easy and just as light and just as efficient. And just look at these beautiful things when they haven't been used at all. This is a new set in. Um, one of my students had a little play with them the other day before she bought a set. But other than that, but again, you see the, pa the papers do cover most of the pastels, so they want to be taken off almost as soon as you have them. And the way around that is to get a sheet of pastel paper or ordinary paper, put a little bit of colour on each, and you'll colour note of what the number was beside it so you don't forget which colour was which, and then you've got a full range of pastels to use and you won't worry about it wearing out and buying a new pastel. Right, we'll make a start then. I want a nice vibrant sunny picture. I'm going to start with pink in my sky. That might seem a bit strange to some people because they think of blue skies and blue water and green trees and brown earth. But I just don't see colours in that way. I see a lot more colour than many people do. Um, I'm going to blend on top of this with other colours later and make it really, really vibrant. So I'll have this pink and I'll put a little bit of blue over it later and then maybe even um, cross hatch a little bit of uh, yellow onto that as well to really give myself a nice vibrant picture. I'm not going to put all the little details in, just the larger areas that I want in this colour. It's going to come down to here as well, I can see that. And the sunlight catches that. The bridge, well, I'll probably do a, a blue, a, a grey for that one. <laughs> For the moment, something like that colour, and I can put the pink over it later. So you see how beautifully this sandpaper takes the pastel, and because it's got such a nice tooth to it, it um, will take several layers before it starts to have problems. If you uh, do put the wrong colour on, you can easily get out of it by just taking a brush and brushing it off again, for instance. And I'm right back to my paper just as easily as that. Of course, the same thing can happen if you brush against it, so you have to be very careful. I've got this um, sandpaper actually stuck onto a Winsor & Newton pre-prime canvas with the plastic still on. The beauty of that is that the canvas and the stretcher are very light and taut, and if you're going to be working away in landscapes especially, you don't have to be carrying a heavy drawing board. It's a neat trick of mine that you might want to consider using in the future. Of course, eventually you can use the canvas anyway if you want to. I'm just blocking in these mid-tones. I know I'm going to put other colours over the top later. This is just to establish what's going where. I'm leaving little bits of white in between at the moment so I know where I am. I don't lose all my drawing then. Let's come back to the horizon and I want a blue-green here, just feather across. These strokes going from side to side, just touching with the end of the pastel are called feathering. Where. 
Remember, you're going from warm in the foreground to cooler and cooler and cooler into the distance. several greens in here. You can see how quickly you can make a pastel work. You can bring them up very, very quickly. Take the paper off the pastels. These unisons are superb because they're nice and chunky, they don't just disintegrate on you. You can't work sideways with a pastel with paper all around it. It's okay if you're doing a very, very fine tinting technique. If you want to work big and gutsy like this, you've got to get that paper off. I'm sure about this sandpaper. Uh, it's a completely different sort of stuff, but I don't really, really want to see that anyway. I'm using a grey here. You can get this glass paper in, uh, in, in different um, colours anyway, but I just prefer the grey to start off with. Softly blending in, getting rid of all of the paper. I can still see some of my drawing through there, but I've got a nice creamy surface to work on now. And I like to have my pastels looking a bit like an oil painting. I like them really beautifully creamy and I can put on pastel just like I'm painting with a brush. My fingers become the brush and extension instead of a brush to my mind and my eye. Very much more tactile than painting with oil. Right up into here where the sky comes through those leaves. Feathering down, you can leave those lines if you like them. I like a few little bits of texture and lines like that. The light coming up into here. Right up there. You see you can put lights over dark with pastel. <coughs> now if I want to try a little bit of broken colour, I can come back and start adding in little feathered strokes of another colour over the top to give myself a bit of vibrancy. Just making, like I was saying earlier, broken colour, one colour against another. Bring that up into here. Look at that light we can get with pastels. Isn't that a beautiful light already coming there? Quite pleased with the way that's coming. The distant hills here, I can use that very pale blue just to pick out the tops of the trees. I don't have to go any further with this one. Uh, next time you see this, we'll have the finished painting. Uh, this was just to give you an idea of another way of using the pastels. We've seen them used over, over watercolour and inks. Now you've seen the pastel used directly in the traditional way of using pastels, of blocking and blending, and then working over the top. Well, we've done our traditional watercolour. Now let's have a bit of fun, even more fun, and a bit of experimenting. I mentioned earlier about using pastels and pastels with watercolour. This unison set here, and pastels can be blended with water. But I'm also going to use these here, these uh, acrylic inks and Indian inks, which are waterproof when they actually dry. I'm going to work very, very fast and very, very loosely, um, almost crudely in a way, but I want really vibrant, bright colours and dark background colours let that dry, then I'm going to work the pastel over the top. So let's have a bit of fun and just see how fast and loose we can be. I really shall be working fast this time, so... <laughs> Not quite ten minutes, but it uh, <laughs> won't be far off.
pussyfoot about, get some colour off. You see I've got white daisies here, but I haven't got to worry too much because I'm using pastel I can put them back in later anyway. I'm just going to give an indication of where they are, that's all. It's great fun working like this because you haven't got to worry. You just get the basics in and enjoy yourself. So we've got this very garish, but nice and bright sketch, which we're now ready to work on with pastel. That's it. On to the pastels now. Right. I mentioned earlier about being able to blend pastel into watercolour paper, so. Even though the paper's still damp, we can work onto wet paper, you can even work onto completely soaked paper and the pastel will blend in and you can wash it in with a brush and actually when it dries it's more fixed than using a fixative. So it's quite useful if you want to do several layers on ordinary paper. In this case though, let me just show you, I'll put a little bit of dark green in and around here and although I shall blend with my finger a bit, and it's probably better to use a hot press paper for this because you can much smoother paper. This, this is a knot paper so it's in between some of these darker greens in here. You can see the effects are quite pleasant. But if, if we want to, we can take some clean water and blend this in, just like watercolour. So I can leave my rough areas, or I can blend in with a brush as well to go into some drawing around these leaves. So you can see the advantages. Now if you've got a watercolour that's gone wrong and you've overworked it, no harm in considering using this technique to work up and over it and strengthen it. So you can be as delicate as you like with the original drawing and watercolour, or you can be really loose and free like this. See the sort of vibrance we can get now over the top of even this fairly strong ink. I'm now putting in some really flash bits of pink to pick up on these daisies. 
and I haven't blended yet with the water. I'll do that a bit later on. I just want to show you the sorts of vibrancy and colour intensity you can get by using pastels over watercolour or inks like this. Those roses in the background there can really hit some strong colour. So you can now bring in darks, which you couldn't go to with watercolours, as cleanly and as dark as this. Well, I suppose techniques. It's great fun. Now, it's not quite dry enough for my daisies yet, but I'm going to hit those blues a bit stronger here now. Let's have a look at my, my blues over here. Because I can be so vibrant with these colours now, so much purer. Look at those gorgeous colours we can get working like this one over another. I'm going to play a few cools amongst this warm to make those seem even brighter as well. Yeah, I'm quite happy working this way. I might do a few more of these this week. the board because I want to be nice and clean with the pastel. It's still a little bit damp. Where it's dry a look we can get much stronger little areas of white. Roses up there. No, I'm almost there now. I don't need to do a lot more on this. A little bit of sunlight here and there, but for a study, that's fine. And you can see now the technique that I use and how it could benefit you as well. <laughs> a little bit more to do. Well, I'm going to finish now. I've almost finished. This is my darkest dark, just to lead the foreground in a nice warm dark. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm sure you will. In fact, I enjoyed all my painting. But this way of working is so free and so loose. You really must try it. example of an acrylic ink, not watercolour this time, just pure acrylic ink and uh, nice and loose, wet into wet, letting it dry off. Now I shall work the pastels in over the top of it, cutting into the edges, putting the lights over the darks, and cutting some of the darks around the lights. Nice free way to work and so vibrant with these acrylic inks, far more vibrant than watercolour. This way we can work the negatives up as well. We haven't got to, like watercolour, stick with going from light to dark. We can go either way, which is so free and uh, lovely with pastel.
since our time finished here. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and I hope you've enjoyed this taster as well because that's all it was meant to be. This wasn't an in-depth teaching video, it was just to get you going, just to give you a taste of all the different ways of working and to share my experience. We hope over the next year and in the short future to uh, make further videos in more depth of each area of painting using the Yorkshire area, coming right round from the coast and up into the Dales. And I hope you'll share those with us as well. Bye for now then and see you then. Good luck. And we have. That's most important. <laughs> 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 <laughs>